Okay, morning everybody. Uh, back to the Gemara after a week's uh, break. Um, we were talking about something that those of you who have been on the uh, Tanakh journey with us are very familiar with, and that's the story of David to Merav and Michal. Um, and it's quite amazing how often our different shiurim inter intersect with one another. And this is another example, because we were uh, asking the question um, of how come David could marry two sisters while they were still both alive. Well, he couldn't marry one if it was dead, obviously. It means, I didn't say that quite right. But two, two uh, sisters, um, whilst the, both of them were still alive. Um, that is not allowed, according to the um, uh, Torah. We read that on Yom Kippur in the laning. And um, we asked that question. And um, we had two answers. We had two answers. Right at the bottom of page 110, I'm going to put it on the screen in a sec, in the Steins out. It's on 19b in the um, uh, Vilna Shas. Let me put it on the screen for you. There we go. Um, so, Sha'alu Talmidav et Rabbi Yossi. Rabbi Yossi's pupils asked him, Heich nasa David shte achayot b'chayehen. How come David could marry, see that word nasa, Nasa. That, oh, there's another interaction with our shiurim there, by the way. What have we been talking about in the tefillah shiur the last few weeks? Birkat Kohanim. Birkat Kohanim. Okay, well, what's another name for Birkat Kohanim? Duchen. Duchen, okay. What's another name? Oh, Nasiya, was it something? Yeah, yeah, go on. Go on, Leslie. Nasiya Kohanim, isn't it? Nasiya a or something. Like Very that. good. Nasiat kapayim, which means kapayim, so laying the hands, raising up the hands, raising up, the hands. raising right. up. So nasa, uh, but it also means to uh, to marry. How do you? What word do you know that that you know um, from uh, that means a marriage? Go on. Nisuim. 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 That's right. Nisuim means marriage. So um, what's the connection between marriage and um, Nasiat Kapayim? Presumably the Kohanim are actually effectively like getting married to the community, is having the same sort of feelings. That's a nice idea. Um, of with, course, love, with love. The Ahava with love, that's a good one. Yes. Remember the Kohenim are only the conduit for the for the blessing. They're not giving the blessing. Uh, but yes, you could argue that there's a connection there of the Ahava. That's a nice idea. Um, it's I think the 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 the, the simple answer. Um it, that's the homiletical answer, uh, uh, Leslie. But I think the okay. simple answer um is in the way um we uh, acquire things. How do we acquire something in Jewish law? When you when you go and do your selling of your chametz, which is all a bit yeah. of a uh, a bit of a <laughs> you know what's it? Um, how do you do it? What do you have to do? You take the handkerchief. A contract. You have to make a contract. You take a handkerchief, and what do you do with that handkerchief? You make a contract. You make well, you a raise, contract. You, raise you it, lift yeah. it up. That's right. You lift it up. And that is an act of acquisition. It's called an act, act of kinyan, okay? And I think that the reason that um, the word nasa, meaning to marry, um, is that, in, in fact, the, the groom is acquiring himself a bride. Um, and, of course, it's done with three different methods of acquiring this bride, which are, what are the three methods of acquiring yourself a wife? Go on, Jeffrey. Well, I can think of betrothal and chuppah, and and the, the other one is living with her. Okay, well, that's one of them. Bia, intimate relations is one. Bia, shtar, 
What's a star? Document. Yeah, that's also a star, by the way. What's that? Um, money. That's called a star as well. It's a document. Why is that called a star? Because it's a piece of paper, isn't it? It's worth. It's worthless, yeah. except that it's a piece I'm of paper. The the bearer. Yeah, it's a piece of paper which is a document. Star is a document. So that is in fact, in effect, a document. So what document happens when you get married? The ketuba. So bia, that's in, intimate relations. Star, and what's the third one? Yeah. Gift. Yeah, yeah, giving a, a ring. Gift, a gift, a gift. Kese, money, something of monetary value. Okay. Um, and of course, that's the ring. And you'll notice that when you when you go to a chuppah, there are witnesses um, to the this thing because it, it's a it's a contract you're making when you get married. Um, and they witnesses have to look at the ring. And the person who is doing the marriage, the Masader Kedushin, uh, the one who is organizing the, the, the wedding, will ask the witnesses to confirm that this ring is worth, and you'll see in a, in a few minutes why I'm, why I'm stressing this point, that, the, this is, that it is worth, what do they ask the witnesses? Anybody here been a witness under the chuppah? Yeah. Many years. What, were you, what were you asked by the rabbi about the ring? If it was well, worth more than a certain figure. Okay, if it was worth more than a certain figure. What was that figure? Do you remember? Um, no. <laughs> it's called, uh, in Hebrew, it's called a pruta. Oh, a pretty. pruta, which is a very small amount of money. Um, so uh, the pruta, it's pence. Right, it has to be worth something. So they'll say to you, "Is this worth more than a pruta?" Okay, it has to be worth at least a pruta. Um, usually, it's made out of gold or something like that. So uh, it usually is worth more than a pruta. Uh, what's the other thing that the rabbi will ask under the chuppah about the ring, not to you as witnesses? Does it belong to you? Does it belong to who? To the to the groom. To the groom. Why? Why will he ask that? Because you, he's he's the one who's got to give a, a something of value. Yeah, yeah, correct. I, I remember it was a wonderful, a wonderful spontaneous moment at my second son's wedding, which was conducted by my oldest son. Um, <laughs> uh, and he said under the chuppah to uh, to his brother, Akiva, he said, uh, is this yours? Yes. Did you buy it with your own money? Yes. Are you sure dad didn't buy it for you? <laughs> <laughs> and it, it, was, it, it, was, it was just a lovely, lovely moment. Um, <laughs> I think he said, are you sure you didn't use dad's credit card or something? By the way, that's the other thing. Uh, you can't buy it with a credit card. Right. The groom is not allowed to buy the ring with a credit card. You can buy it with a debit card, but not with a credit card. Why not? Because it doesn't belong to you until you've paid for it. So you paid yeah. for it, yeah. Yeah. yeah the, the, so you the, can the, use that... a credit card provided you uh, provided you've actually paid the amount on the yeah. credit card. Yeah. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Do, do people you, you've got know to have that? paid it off. You've got to have paid it off. So you know, listen. Do, doing a, a wedding, it's not just uh, stand there and look pretty and uh, sing a couple of uh, Sheva brochas. It's you've got to know what you're doing. Um. So so they ask these questions. So the ring has to be worth a pruta. Just bear that in mind as we go through this next Gemara. So, um, so how did, uh, how come, says these pupils, how come David married two uh, sisters during their lifetimes? So Rabbi Yossi gives the very straightforward and simple answer uh, that he didn't. And he says, Amalahem Michal Achar Mitat Meirav Nasa'a. He married Michal after Meirav had died. There's no evidence for that, by the way, in the Tanakh. Having said that, there's no evidence um, that she didn't. But uh, I'm not sure that Rabbi Yossi has any evidence for that. And I think that probably what Rabbi Yossi is saying is, that's a good question, guys. It must be the case that um, she died before Michal, uh, he married Michal, because David would not have... Um, 
transgressed that uh, commandment. Um, uh, that's that's Rabbi Yossi's view. What's interesting, and what the whole next Gemara is all Why about... Why did they ask the question in the first place, then, if they thought that David would never have done it? Well, that, that's, why they, that's why they asked it. They were saying, hang on a minute, that can't be right. What's going on here? Um, it, it was a good question. And Rabbi Yossi says, you're right, that is a good question. It must be that Meirav had died beforehand. Yeah. Now, the rest of the Gemara, this, of this subject of this Gemara, is based on the next opinion, which is much more interesting than Rabbi Yossi's opinion. It might, it, it's not as straightforward and it's not as simple, but it's much more interesting. And this is what the Gemara is going to discuss in the next uh, uh, few lines or few, few, few paragraphs. Rabbi, Yosh, Rabbi Yeshua ben Korcha Omer, this gentleman says, Kidushei ta'ut hayu lo b'meirav. Um, he was never married to Meirav in the first place. It was a ta'ut. Ta'ut means? Mistake. A mistake. It was an incorrect, it wasn't done properly. We have the concept of a mekach ta'ut, a, uh, a piece of business. Mekach is a, is a, 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 a transaction, that's the word. Mekach ta'ut in halakha is a transaction that was done incorrectly. So, for example, if, if you come, I think we discussed this last time, we don't have the concept in Jewish law of caveat emptor, that the buyer beware, um, you are obliged as a seller to point out any substantial defects in what you're selling if they are not obvious. You know, if you come to buy a car and the door's hanging off, then you don't have to say to the guy, look, the door's hanging off, because that's plain and simple. But if you know that it needs a new gearbox um, and that's not obvious, then in Jewish law, you have an obligation, if you're selling it, um, to tell the buyer um, that there's something wrong with it. OK, and that and if not, he can come back to you and take you to Basedin afterwards and say this was a mekach ta'ut. It was a false mistake and transaction. And had I known in the first place that the gearbox had gone, I would never have bought this car. And therefore, the transaction should be deemed invalid. And therefore, I should have my money back and you can have your Verstunkene car back. Um, so uh, that would be a mekach ta'ut. Here, we're talking about a kidushei ta'ut, that the kidushin the whole marriage was a uh, mistaken, a false, incorrect, not legal marriage. Uh, and as I think we mentioned last time, this is often the basis of trying to get out of a situation of mamzei root. Um, I think I mentioned this last time, but it bears rep repeating again. Um, there are some uh, uh, rabbis, I, I, I find this very difficult to get my head around, but I, I know it's a fact that, that this happens. There are some rabbis that deliberately bring witnesses who are potentially dodgy witnesses um, so that if sometime in the future uh, this marriage were to fail and the woman would not get a proper get and would go off with another fellow um, and have a child through that second fellow without getting a get from the first one, that the child would normally in that situation be a mamzer, which is a terrible situation. They can then come retrospectively and say, ah, this was a kidushe ta'ut because the witnesses were not valid. This particular witness was no good and therefore uh, in retrospect, this first marriage was never a marriage, and therefore this uh, child of the second relationship is not a mamzer. I know it's convoluted, and you might think, you know, that takes a bit of believing, but in fact, um, that is uh, done on occasions. I'm not saying that's a regular occurrence, but it has been known to have been done in the past. And certainly, if a based in was to be faced with a situation of potential mamze root, they would certainly go back to the original wedding and try their hardest to find a reason why they could call it a kidushe ta'ut to prevent the mamze root status of the later child. 
Would the couple know it. that, Johnny, at the time? No, 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 no. This is all under under the table. It's oh. one of those things, Johnny, that you do and nobody ever knows about it. And it's one of those things that you have in your bottom drawer and you hope yeah. never to use it. You know, it's a bit like a prenup, right? Yeah. When okay. you've got when you make a prenuptial agreement uh, between a, 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 a bride and groom, you're making an agreement on the basis that if something should go wrong with this wedding, with this marriage, and you need a divorce, then X, Y, and Z will come into effect. And you hope to put that prenup in the bottom drawer and never ever use it. And, uh, you know, after 120 years, you die with it still in the bottom drawer. But you've got it if you need it. It's that sort of thing. Nobody ever says, oh, I'm going to get a dodgy witness here just in case this, uh, you know, I don't fancy this marriage. I think it's going to break down. So we'll have a dodgy witness just in case. But I have heard of it being done um, <laughs> and it's there and has been used in the past. It's so can the, can, the wedding guest, can the wedding guest get their presents back? <laughs> Uh -huh. It's a storyline. Yeah, probably. In the book um, Beauty Queen of Jerusalem. On the book, what? Sorry, Julie, I missed that. The Beauty Queen of Jerusalem. It is a storyline that the um, the son who was born out, what appeared to be out of wedlock, was thought for years and years that he was a mamzer, and the rabbi. But eventually they they um, spoke to was able to show that in fact he wasn't. It was a, it's a very interesting storyline. And is that the they 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 disqualified the first wedding on some basis? Is that how it went? It wasn't how that I don't think that I actually haven't read the book. I've only seen it on TV, and that wasn't how it came over. But they were able to with discussions and consideration to conclude. That the uh, boy was okay. not. Okay, and what's it called? The Beauty Queen of Jerusalem. The Beauty Queen of Jerusalem. <laughs> right, that's going to be my homework for next week. Let me write it down. I'm going to find out about the Beauty Queen of Jerusalem. That sounds fascinating. Okay, I wonder if they do it as an audio book. Well, it, it's a um, really good TV series. The television yeah. series. Mm. I haven't got time for TV series, but if it's an audio book, I can listen to it while I'm running. So uh, I'll look into that. That's very interesting. Thank you. Anyway, um, on this basis, Kitushe Ta'ut Hayu Lo Bemeirav. Here's our Gemara. Rabbi Yeshua Ben Korcha says, it must have been a dodgy <laughs> wedding with Meirav in the first place. And he brings a proof from a pasuk that we will get to in our Tanakh Shir in a couple of months. It's in Shmuel Bet, uh, chapter um, uh, three, and I've got it up on the screen for you now. There it is. Um, David sent mes messengers to Ish Boshet, the son of Saul. Oh, I'm doing your job, Jeffrey. You do it. And David sent messages to Ish Boshet, the son of Saul, saying, Give my wife Michal whom I espoused to myself with 100 foreskins of Philistines. Stop there. So David sends a messenger <clears throat> to Shaul's son, Ishbosheth, who, <clears throat> who had succeeded Shaul, albeit only for a short period of time. And he says, give me my wife, Michal. And what doesn't he say by implication? Yes, Julia, you're muted. He doesn't mention the other one. He doesn't one. say Meral. Yes, to he tell doesn't you. say, give, give me my work wife, Meral. I have to now. tell you that this is hard for me. My, my daughter-in-law is called Meral, and she is married to my son, who is called Benjamin David. Um, <laughs> so, so I'm rooting for Meral. You're rooting for Meral. Okay, well, let's see what happens with Meral. So... Rabbi Yeshua ben Korcha says, when David uh, goes, sends a messenger to um, his rival Ishbosha and says, give me my wife, he doesn't say, give me my wife, Meirav. And therefore, says Rabbi Yeshua ben Korcha, it must be that he was never married to Meirav. Is anybody um, um, happy? Is anybody not happy with that explanation? I, I still abide by my theory that I developed two weeks ago, that, that Saul offered a, um, a daughter 
for the person who killed Goliath. And there is nothing to say that 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 prize wasn't awarded at the time. We know that Michal loved David. We don't know whether Merab did. But um, but the, the, the bit about the foreskins was a secondary thing. We don't know that it wasn't a second marriage. We don't okay. know it. Okay, so if we take your theory that it was a second marriage, then we've got our original question, haven't we? How could he marry two wives? Now, maybe Rabbi Yossi is right that Meirav had passed away by then. Um, we don't know. Uh, Rabbi Yeshua ben Korcha says, I can prove, prove to you that Meirav was not his wife because he never asked for her. He only asked for Michal. Anybody other than me unhappy with that explanation? Well, didn't Saul, didn't Saul give, uh, give uh, Michal to somebody else? Well, he, Saul's got form because he gave both of them to somebody else, which we will see. You're right, Michael, but we'll see later on. It get, becomes very confusing about who he gave to whom. Um, um, so I'll tell you why I'm unhappy with this. I'm unhappy because he might just not have liked Mirav. Right? He may not have wanted her back. We know about Yaakov didn't like Leah, says so. She was a snua. She was a hated wife. Who's to say that David didn't want to leave Meirav where she was with Ishboshet and only wanted Michal back? So I, for one, I'm not happy with the proof that Rabbi Yeshua ben Korcha brings to prove that the marriage to Meirav was not a marriage. I'm not impressed with it, but. We'll go along with it because the Gomorrah goes along with it and we have to learn the rest of the Gomorrah because it's interesting. But just on the basis, I think this is a very shaky foundation to start an explanation on. To say that because he sent for Michal and didn't send for Meirav doesn't necessarily to me mean that he wasn't married to Meirav. Might have been glad to get rid of her. She might have been a machshefer, who knows? The article that you sent last week mentioned that Marav had five children. Do we We're come coming to that later? later in the Gemara. That's where it gets very confusing um, because, well, I won't spoil it. It gets, just take it from me, it gets very confusing as to whose five children these were, whether they were Marav's at all or whether they were somebody else's. Uh, it's a right mess, to be honest, and we'll see as we go along. Let's go on. So we're going over the page in the Steins out. Um, so the um, Gemara says, wait a minute. Um, where, uh, my Talmuda, where is, wh where'd you get that from? Says, um, uh, how do you know? Uh, that from just because he calls Michal his wife and he doesn't call Meirav his wife, how do you know? And Rav Papa says, because he calls Michal his wife and he doesn't refer to uh, Meirav. Mm. Okay, we're not, I'm not all that fussed with that. I don't think it's a great explanation. And I don't think the Gomorrah's all that chuffed with it either. But he goes along with it and he says, okay, all right then. If you're going to tell me it was a, um, a, false wedding that the 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 uh contract was a an illegal contract my kidushe taut in what way was the first wedding to Meirav disqualified in what made it a kidushe taut what made it an illegal marriage and um the gemara answers well there is a pasuk um that says, and uh, and um, Julia quoted it just now. I'll take you to the whole of the Pasuk because, as usual, the Gemara only quotes half the Pasuk. And as usual, the Gemara, and I don't know why the Gemara does this. I think it's just playing with us. The Gemara quotes half the Pasuk, but always quotes the wrong half of the Pasuk, the bit that's not relevant, and leaves us to sort of have to know the bit that is relevant. So I'm going to take you to the actual Pasuk. It's in Shmuel Aleph chapter 17. And there it is. Um, uh, there it is. Uh, no, 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 it's not. It's in Shmuel. Um, 
Uh, where is it? Shmuel. That's not Shmuel out of 17. That's Shmuel out of 17. There you go. Jeffrey on the screen, mate. First 25. And the men of Israel said, have you seen this man who is coming up? For he is coming up to taunt Israel. And it will be that the man who will kill him, the king, will enrich him with great riches. And he will give him his daughter. And he will make his father's house free in Israel. Okay, excellent. Right. So that's what Julia was referring to earlier on. Let's just stop and recap this Pasuk. Sha'ol, uh, um, well, the first thing we have to say is that this is hearsay because the men of Israel said, right? This is not Sha'ol saying, but let's leave that aside, okay? Um, that's the pretend lawyer in me saying that it was hearsay, but there you go. Um, he said... Shaul promises three things. What is? What are they? Number it's, one, it's great riches. 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 Yeah. Number two, tax the free. daughter. The daughter. And number three, tax free. Tax free. Okay. Right now, it's there's seen... only one daughter mentioned here, as though he only had one proper uh, 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 legal daughter. Well, it can only be one daughter that he gives him because he's not allowed to marry two, is he? But it doesn't say he'll give him one of his daughters. It'll say he'll no, give him his daughter. Yeah, it doesn't say which one, but I don't think it necessarily implies that he only has one because we know that he has more than one anyway. Uh, okay. But he can only give him one. So that's Agreed. why it's in the, in the singular. Um, but what's important is the first part of this. It wasn't just, as Julia remembered, that he will give him his wife. What else was he going to give him? Riches. Riches. He was going to give him a sum of a sum of money. Guess a bazaar, silver and gold, right? He's going to give him money. Remember that. That's important. So let's go back to the Gemara. Oh, what happened there? I tried to scan you all by mistake. Uh, Sanhedrin. There we go. Right. So, um, so the Pasuk says. Um, the Gemara quotes the first half of the Pasuk, which says the man will get great riches. And I said to you, that's the wrong half of the Pasuk, because the, pas the bit that we're interested in is the betrothal of his daughter. But I was teasing you because actually this part of the Pasuk is very, very valid and important. The fact that he was giving riches, as you will see. Right, let's see what happens in the Gemara. Azal, he went, Katlei, he killed him. In other words, David went and killed Goliath. So he's fulfilled his side of the bargain. Amar lo, he said to him, who said to who? Shaul said to David, Milve it lach gabai. Milve. What's milve? A leviah? Hello. Okay, a leviah. Who said a leviah? Leslie. Leslie. What does a leviah mean? Um, a funeral. A funeral. Why is it called a funeral? I mean, no. Why is, it, why is a funeral called a leviah? What does the word leviah mean? It's accompanying somebody yes. to the grave of the yes. next world. Yes. Uh, Levaya means to accompany. accompany. So so um, we understand the word Levaya to be a funeral because we are accompanying the dead on their last journey. But the word means to accompany. We have a mitvah in the Torah of Levaya, of Levaya, of accompanying. What is that mitzvah in the Torah? of accompanying. Anyone? I'll give you a clue. It's a bit of a, uh, but an obscure clue, but D David might know what I'm talking about. Uh, it's a kind of tree. Is that too obscure? Olive tree. No. I'll tell you the Hebrew word for the tree. Eshel. Oh, it's uh, acorn. No. An eshel. We are told that Abraham Avinu 
planted an eshel, it's a type of tree. And the Mephorashim say that what that means is that eshel is a, an acronym. It's an acronym. Everybody know what an acronym is? An acronym is that it stands for something. So the, Eshel stands for... The three angels to the... Yeah, to the what point. does Eshel stand for, David? Something shalosh, the something. Achila? It's an in, an in isn't it? Yes. Le Achila, Achila Lina. Shtia, oh, drinking, sleeping. and Levia, accompanying. We have a mitzvah that when somebody leaves, if your guest leaves, it's a mitzvah to accompany them on your journey. You will often find that when you go to visit somebody who is very pious and they say goodbye to you, they will accompany you for a few steps outside the house. Julia is smiling. Have you had that experience, Julia? My I know husband, what you're going to say. Let, I know what you're going to say. Let me say. Let me say. You're going to say that your Sephardi family do that, right? No, I'm afraid not. I was going oh. to say that my non-pious husband does it all the time. Well, that's very good. He's so more I, pious I than you him. think. Then he's more pious than you give him credit for, uh, because that's a very pious thing to do. Yes, it's a mitzvah to accompany uh, the 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 person on their journey, and you will often find that that people will accompany you as Roger does, um, a few steps outside the house. You don't, when somebody leaves um, your house, the least you, you do is you get up off your chair and you accompany them to the door, right? You don't I just say... They take them round to the lift, you know, because... Yeah, just, you don't just say goodbye, right. sitting on your seat and let them yeah. walk to the door on their own. Nobody does, that's rude, right? So you get up off your seat and you accompany them to the door. That is fulfilling the mitzvah of... Levia, of accompanying them. Those who are particular about the mitzvah, like Roger, will accompany them a little bit further outside of the house. Now, it has some very practical considerations. Not so practical these days, but it has some Torah practical con uh, uh, considerations with a particular very weird mitzvah that we have discussed in the past in this Gemara Shia. Way, way, way back. The mitzvah of Egla Arufa. What is the mitzvah of Egla Arufa? And take the away before you take away the eggs. Of the, the, no, the no. Chip. No, yeah. that's, that, that is um, Shiluah Hakein. Yeah. Okay. Egla Arufa. Egla, what's Egla? What's an Egel? You know Egel. what an Egel is? Egla Arufa means a broken net. Uh, when when do we do the ceremony of breaking a calf's neck? No, before Yom Kippur, isn't it? Um, you take no, that's a, go that's a goat oh, on Yom Kippur that we chuck down a, a cliff. We're a very cruel bunch. When somebody when we... dies between two villages. Yeah, and we don't very know good, which... Michael. Tell us, tell us the story, Michael. Well, the, a dead body is found somewhere between two villages and they have to measure the distance between the two and the one that it's closest to, they have to uh, say it wasn't us and they uh, sacrifice effectively will break the neck of a calf. Perfect, perfect explanation. And the answer, the, the question then is, why do they have to do that? The one that's nearest. Just in case it was somebody in from their village. Yes, uh, and because perhaps... They did not accompany him on his journey appropriately, and therefore he was attacked by bandits. OK, so this mitzvah of levia, of accompanying, has a practical consideration. OK, so there is a mitzvah in the Torah of levia. Now, so when we say a levaya, we mean a funeral usually, but the word means to accompany. So, you know, we, we should all be meritorious to, to be to do Roger's type of levia rather than the other type. And then, we, you know, we should accompany people whilst they're still alive, like Roger does. Good for him. Well done. Right. So how did we get on to that? Um, I have no idea. What were we talking about? Oh, yes. Milve. So yeah, I asked you about the word milve and Leslie led, a led us down a dead end um, to a funeral. 
Um, so what does the word milve mean? I'll give you a clue. You say it every time you have a meal with bread. There's a big clue. So it must be in what? Bracha. What kind of bracha must it be if you've eaten bread? Birchat Amazon. Birchat Amazon, okay. Where is it in Birchat Amazon, that word? Um, okay, here we go. I've got it in front of me now. <laughs> okay, let's go from Rachem Na. Rachem Na Shemalakena. We're going to do benching in our Tfilis here very shortly. Oh, well, probably not very shortly, knowing us, but eventually. Um, so here's another intersection. Rachem Na Shemalakena, Al Yisrael Amecha. I have mercy, Hashem, on Israel, your people, the Al Yerushalayim Irecha. And on Jerusalem, your city, the Alt Sion Mishkan Kvodecha, and on Zion, the resting place of your glory, the Al Malchut Beit David Mishichecha, and on the kingdom of David, your anointed one, the Al Habayit Hagadol Vakadosh and Nikoshim Chaalav, and on the great house, the holy house on which your name is called, meaning the Bet Mikdash, Eloheinu, our God, Avinu, our Father, Ra'enu, our Shepherd, Zunenu. Uh, our sustainer, Farnasenu, the one who gives us sustenance. Chalkelenu, another word for the one who gives us sustenance. Vaharvichenu, give us, uh, um, uh, give us revach, give us uh, uh, abundance. Vaharvach, lanu Hashem elokeinu, meheru mekol tzaratenu. And may Hashem give us um, rest from all our troubles. Vena, and please, al tatsrichenu, you've all sung this a million yeah. times, yeah? What does it mean? Vena, and please, Al Tatrichenu, let us not need Hashem Alakenu, our God. Lo Lide Matnat Basar Vadam. We should not need to come into the hands of a matana. A gift of basar vadam, a gift from flesh and blood, right? Let us not need tzdaka, as it were, from a human being. Velo lide halvatam, and not into their hands for a... We're asking not that we shouldn't need a, a, a gift from somebody, a human being, and not a... No. Alone, very good, Johnny. Yeah, alone. And let us not require a loan from a human being. So the word halva'a means alone, right? Now, uh, in Israel, that is a very, very common word. I don't know about you, but I am, you probably don't read them, uh, uh, but I get in texts all the time from my bank asking me if I want a halva'a. They're trying to get me to take a loan, right? You can say you can have an instant loan of 100,000 shekels and blah, 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 right? They don't tell you that the interest rates are like mental high. But anyway, you'll have a look in your, in your SMS messages. You'll find, I'm sure, something from your bank that uses the word halva'a, which means a loan, okay? So we've established what this word means now, a loan. Now, it is connected to the word levia, which is an accompanying why. Why is a loan? What's the connection between a loan and accompanying? Because you're in their hands all the time. Yeah, that loan accompanies you wherever yeah. you go. So you pay you it back. <laughs> I think that's I think that's the, the root. I think that's the connection anyway. So the Gemara says, uh, Amalo, he said to him, Milve it lach gabai. You have got a loan uh, in my possession. Gab I, yeah, you've got a loan. What's the loan? What loan has David given to Saul? Why did Saul tell him that 
David, I've got a, you. I owe you a loan. I, I you, you, I owe you money. Saul said to David, "Yeah, it why means the money that he David? promised him." Yeah, because he'd been, a because he'd been promised these riches, and he hadn't yet got them. So effectively, David is owed money by Saul. Saul promised, if you kill Goliath, you'll get riches, a daughter, and tax-free status. Well, he hadn't given him the money yet. So therefore, effectively, David is owed money by Saul, right? Stay with me here, because it gets a little complicated. And so, what they, the Gemara then says, V'hamakadesh b'milver eina mekudeshet. We said, did we not, that in order to be Makadesh, a woman, to marry a woman, you have to give them something of value. Now, what if the bride owed the groom a hundred quid? And under the chuppah, the groom said, um, I tell you what, bride, um, we'll cancel the debt and we'll consider it as if have given you the hundred quid that you owe me. Is that considered as the groom giving the bride something of value? Why not, Julia? You're muted. I am muted, and I only said no because I think I, I read on. But having said that, I actually don't agree because I think he is giving something of value, but obviously I'm wrong. OK, so he, he, he you're right. You're right. You're not wrong. You're right. Uh, you're right that you're wrong, um, that uh, it, it is not considered a kiddushin. It's, it's not, not to the events. It's not considered giving something. You have who's been a witness again under the chuppah? Jeffrey, you've been a witness. Who else? Somebody else had their hand up before. Who's been a witness under the chuppah? Johnny, yeah. When you were a witness, you were not only asked whether the ring was worth a pruta. What else did you have to do? Did he buy it? I think. Yeah, yeah to accept. I did think he buy you it? Had to vouch, you had to vouch that the he... um, that the the people who you were witnessing had not been married, or are not married to somebody else. No, that's not your job under the chuppah. Don't you have to ask if it's whole, a complete ring or something? No, that's not your job either. Okay. Your job is two things under the chuppah. If it one, to you. one is that ring worth a pruta? And what did you just say, Michael? That it belongs to you. Yes, yeah, so that's the job of the Masada Kedushin, not yours. All right. Right? He has to convince himself that it's his, and you have to hear that. Okay, so that's fair enough. There's one more thing you have to witness. What is it? David, what is it? What do the witnesses have to witness? Under the chuppah? Is it giving yeah. it? Say that again, Julia. Is it actually giving it? Yes. You have to witness the ring being placed on the finger of the bride. Oh. If you can't see, the Masada Kedushin will make sure that the witnesses will um, will be able to see the ring going on the finger. And then what happens? What does the uh, what does the Masada Kedushin say and asks the witnesses to say? Can you remember what you said under the chuppah when you viewed that ring going on? Was it harayat something? No, oh, no, no, you don't say that or else you end up married to the bride. Hare at means behold, you are betrothed to me. Hare at mekudeshet li betabat zu. Behold, you are betrothed or married to me betabat zu with this ring. Kedat Moshe Yisrael. If you say that, you, you, well, there's a bit of a problem there. You might be married to the woman. So you'll notice, by the way, um, in, 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 when you've got a bridegroom who knows what he's doing and can say it, without having to be repeated word for word, or he reads it off a thingy, there's no problem. But in many places, particularly in United Synagogue type thingies, where the bridegroom's a bit clueless, the yeah. Masada Kedushin will say it word for word. 
and he will say, Hare, and the, the Chosen says, Hare, at, at, Mekudeshet, Mekudeshet. But he will not say the word Li. Somebody <laughs> else will say the word Li. Uh, you may, may never have noticed that. But yeah. um, under the chuppah, there's always, there's always somebody else knocking around there, the guy with the microphone or the person pouring the wine, you know, the knacker that's there being, being, <laughs> the, being the, the macharon, right? That Masada Kedushin will so have is. somebody there on hand, if he's going to do that word for word business, to say the word li, because he doesn't want to say that whole sentence just in case, with that <laughs> ring going on a finger, he ends up married to her instead of the chos. Right? <laughs> um, so you, you laugh, but you know, this is this is the way it's done. Next time you go to a, a chupa where there's, yeah. you, you probably won't in Israel because most of the chatanim know how to say it or they'll have it off a piece of paper. But seen it hundreds of times uh, in, in the UK. Uh, where you've gone to a wedding and you've got a clueless chosen and he has to have it repeated for him, you'll yeah. see that the Masada Kadushin will not say the word Lee. Somebody else will say it. So no, Leslie, you're on the right track, but it's not Hare At. What oh. do the witnesses say under the chuppah when they see that ring go on the finger? They say one word. Yeah, yeah Jeffrey. Well done, Jeffrey. Merkudeshet. Yeah. I, I said it earlier. Oh, I didn't hear you. Which means, what does the uh, word Mekudeshet mean? The marriage. Done. done. Mekudeshet, it, the job's done. But you only say that when? When you have seen the ring go on the finger. So that's your job as a witness, a very important job. You have to witness, because if Chasva Khalila, the magic breaks down and they want to come and uh, uh, and uh, uh, and and you know, make it a kiddushé ta'ot, make it a, an illegal marriage. They might come to you and, and say, Jeffrey, Jeffrey, are you sure that you saw that? Are you sure you didn't turn round at that moment? Are you absolutely certain that you saw the chos and put the ring on the finger? Um, uh, or, or maybe maybe somebody got in your way at that moment and you didn't actually witness it. Maybe the cameraman had stood in front of you uh, and, and you never got a proper view. Uh, in which case you can't say Mekudeshet. You can only say Mekudeshet if you've convinced yourself that it's worth a pruta and you've seen it go on the finger, right? This is a legal document, a legal contract. You have to be able to say that you are a, uh, a proper witness and that you witnessed it properly. So um, why am I telling you all this? Uh, oh, yeah, Mekudeshet. So, Hamakadesh um, Bermilva, Eino Mekudeshet. So the, the, um, you have to witness the bridegroom giving the bride the gift. So if he just says to the bride, you know what, bride, that hundred quid you owe me, we'll call it quits, uh, and that's my gift to you, you can't say Mekudeshet because you haven't seen him give something to the bride. So it doesn't count. Giving, uh, forgiving a loan, in other words, uh, what's the word? Um, um, obliterating a loan. That's not the right word. I can't think of the word. But doing away with a loan that is owed to you is not considered good enough for Kiddushin. So Rabbi, the Gemara says, how do we know this was a Kiddushi Ta'ot? Because what we didn't know, says the Gemara, is this is what happened at the wedding of David and Merav. David comes along and says, uh, and Saul says to David, I owe you all these riches that I promised you. Tell you what, let's call it quits with the riches and that will be your Kiddushin with Merav. And if that was the case, says Rabbi Yeshua ben Korcha, it's a kiddushay ta'ut. Meirav was never married to David in the first place because it didn't fulfill the correct requirements. OK, you with me so far? Yeah. So yeah. at the moment we think, OK, that's very, very good, isn't it? Um, we've got uh, we've got a, uh, a, 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 a thing here that says this is a kiddushay ta'ut. It's not a good marriage. Um, and we've got... Um, therefore, a reason to say that when David married Michal, later he was not marrying two sisters. 
because the marriage to Meirav was uh, an improper marriage. Okay. And so therefore, says the Gemara, we're over here now. Therefore, as a result of that, in Saul's mind, whether he did this deliberately or didn't do it deliberately, I don't know. But Saul, let's say he didn't do it deliberately. He later on realized, oh, I made a mistake. That wasn't a proper marriage. Or if he did it deliberately, it was deliberately that wasn't a proper marriage because I don't like David and I want to get one over on it. Who knows? Don't know. Azal, he then went along, Saul, Yahava la Adriel. He then gave Meirav to Adriel. Dichtiv. And we've got a proof for that. How do we know that? We know that from Shmuel Aleph, chapter 18. There we go. Uh, here we go. Verse 19, Jeffrey. And it was at the time that Merav, Saul's daughter, should have been given to David, that she was given to Adriel, the Mehalathite, as a wife. Now, OK, we've got a little bit of uh, we've got a, we've got a little bit of uh, shenanigans going on here with the translation, which is why I've highlighted the Hebrew for you. Let's just go for the Hebrew. Vayahi. And it was. But eight. At the at time. The, at the time. Tet. OK. The et tet means at the time of giving. Et merav bat Shaul le David. It literally means at the time of giving merav, the daughter of Shaul to David. She was given to Adriel as a wife. It doesn't say should have been given to David at all. But that's how it's translated. It doesn't make sense otherwise. The way it says in the Hebrew doesn't make sense. In the Hebrew says at the time that of giving David, of, of giving Merav to David, she was given to Adriel as a wife. Well, that can't be. You can't give them to two people at the same time. See, which is why the translation has had to be the time when he should have given it to David, gave it to Adriel. So our Gemara goes along with that and says, um, Saul realized that at the time that he gave David, gave um, Merav to David, it was no good, didn't work. And therefore he gave her to Adriel. Okay. Because by this time already, Shaul's Mishagas had started and he was already trying to get rid of David. He was already trying to dream up schemes of how David would be got rid of by making him go and get these foreskins, etc., which we'll, we'll come to next week. So um, then what happens is, in Saul's mind at least, he's not married to Merav and he gives Merav to Adriel. Remember the name, Adriel. OK, uh, not that we'll get to it this week. You might have to remember Adriel till next week. But I'm going to ask you another question now and test your memory. Um, well, you said before that Merav was given to Adriel. And we also said that Mishal was given to somebody else as well. I said that Saul had four. Go on, Michael. Who was it? Who was it that Michal was given to? Remember, we had that whole business about the sword in the middle of the bed and then being yeah, a big it, 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 it was never it. consummated. I can't remember the name anymore. Anyone remember the name? Paltiel. Paltiel was the name. Uh, it's important when we come to the next bit of Gomorrah. Not next week. I'm going to be in England the week after. So, um, so he gives... Shaul marries off Merav to Adriel. And then he says, at a later date, we then quote the foreskin business. A few sukim later in the same chapter. Let's go back to chapter 18. Um, uh, the, the very next pasuk is Merav, well, the, the one that Jeffrey just read out, that Merav is given to Adriel as a wife. Verse 20, Jeffrey. And Michal, Saul's daughter, loved David. And they told Saul, and the thing pleased him. Go on. 
And Saul said, I shall give her to him and she will be a snare to him and the hand of the Philistines will be upon him. And Saul said to David with, in brackets, one of two, shall you be my son-in-law today? Right, so we had this whole discussion last week about this shtaim and the white the whitewash of one of two. Um, but reading all this again, does it not appear to you, it does to me, that these psukim clearly say that actually David was not married to Miraf. Yeah. The way I read verse 19 and 20 is, yeah. sure, Shaul should have given Merav to David Either he didn't do it or he did it and it was a duff wedding um, and therefore he married her off to somebody else. And then he decided to give it to Michal uh, in, the, in Merav's place because he had this whole plan that, um, that he she would be a snare to him. That's how I read it. It seems very clear to me from yeah. these Tzukim that at least in Shaul's mind, David was not married to Merav. Um, now, this whole Gomorrah is all about why he wasn't married to Merav, the, the, the Mekah Ta'ot and all that, which is really very interesting. But it seems very clear from the Psukim, at least at, first, at surface value, doesn't it, that he wasn't ever married to Merav, that Adriel was married to Merav, uh, and he was married to, to Michal. Um, so let's go back to the Gomorrah again, and we'll just finish off. Um, so he then says, um, go and get for me, a hundred foreskins, right? Go and get me the hundred foreskins. Now, why does he want hundred foreskins? Well, we know why he wants hundred foreskins. <laughs> he wants it because he's going to get killed by the Plishtim while getting it. But I'm afraid that David was up to the job. And not only was he up to the job, he went over the top and he put, how many did he bring? 200. 200. Okay, showing off. There's another interaction with our Tfilah Shir. He was asked for 100, and he went and got 200 over the top, right? Anyway, he brings these foreskins. Look what the Gemara says. So he brings him, and he says, Azal um, he went and brought them to him. Amar he said to him, Saul said to him, Milve upruta itlach gabai. You have now brought me the loan. We've done away with the loan. Okay. And you've brought me something worth a pruta. What is he brought worth a pruta? 204 skins. 204 skins. Would you pay a penny or two for 204 skins? No. <laughs> right. What are you going to do with them? <laughs> what are you going to do with these 204 skins? Well, if you did the bris, you'd take them with you when you went. I would, but they're not worth anything, are they? They're not worth a price. I couldn't go and sell well, them. You for a when you do the bris. Yeah, but it's not going to help me if I go to, if I put them on the market, right? If I put a, a message out on the WhatsApp group <laughs> this afternoon, 1,000 used foreskins for sale. <laughs> do, you think, do you think I'd get any, uh, any responses or any acceptable <laughs> responses? Philip might want them, I don't know, but that's about, you know, <laughs> I can't imagine, I can't imagine that, that anybody would want to buy them. So, so the question is, and we'll do that, um, uh, we'll do this next week. Um, we'll do, we'll carry on next week on this because we're out of time. The question is, Saul is saying, this is a proper marriage because it's not just the loan of the riches. You've also given me something worth a pruta. The foreskins, whether they're worth a pruta or not, we'll come to next week. But I've got another question I want you to consider without looking on. And that is this. When you are the uh, witness under the chuppah, I already told you and you confirmed that you have to watch the chatan put the kala, the ring on the kala. Right. Who's giving the gift? The chatan. Who's receiving the gift? The Kala. In our case, who's giving this thing worth a pruta, these foreskins? The Khatan. Who's receiving them? The father. Oh. Yeah. 
I dare say if David had gone to uh, Michal and said, I'm not bothering giving you a ring. I'm giving you 204 skins instead. What do you think her response would have been? Well, I, I'll tell you what she would have said. I'm not wearing them on my finger. <laughs> so we've got a question. We've got a whole this whole thing. I did warn you it was complicated. This whole thing is a big mess. So we're going to stop there. Um, and I am going to take it off the screen. Uh, if you don't want to uh, spoil it and you want to try and work it out for yourself, don't read on. We're going to be asking next week. No. Not next week. Please God, the week after. Uh, we're going to be asking, how come this worked when he didn't give it to, um, um, to um, Michal, these foreskins? And secondly, are foreskins worth anything? Um, so I want those two questions answered because if you can't answer those questions satisfactorily, then David is not married to Michal either. All right. So there we go. Who said that Gomorrah is boring? Uh, <laughs> I did. That's who said. I used to think that Gomorrah was dead boring, um, but that's because we didn't do it in such a fun way. Right. OK. Any questions on today's uh, um, little outing into Shmuel, Aleph and Bet? Um, and foreskins, etc. Any questions? I think it's you. You brought it to life brilliantly. Thank you so much. Yeah. My pleasure. All right. Well, uh, not next week. The week after, please God, uh, we'll be back. Uh, we'll be back on track. Hopefully.